is here today. Um, I want to just kind of just uh, to reiterate what Athanasius just said. Um, I think that it's a lot of the things that we're going to say today um, obviously are going to touch on uh, and kind of lay the foundation for things like uh, struggles with chastity. I know we, we all, we could go, like he said, we could go an entire day on that. We could and hopefully will uh, soon do an entire day on the topic of LGBT issues, but there's a lot there. So what we're doing today, it's not that like it has nothing to do with it, or we're not going to talk about it, but like we're laying the foundation and really kind of before we enter into those topics, we really need to have firmly in place what we're doing today. So um, it's not like don't talk about it, we're not going to say anything, but it's like we're just laying the foundation. So just to kind of reinforce um, the little context that they gave today. So what we're doing really, as he said, is um, this first talk is really just to lay some foundation for today, uh, and particularly in scripture and in tradition. What are the uh, sacred scriptures and uh, the teaching of the church, particularly the teachings of Pope St. John Paul II, uh, and calling on some uh, key teachings of the Second Vatican Council in the 60s, uh, what those things, uh, what those tell us about this great mystery of uh, how we're created as women and men. So let's dive in. One of the things that um, intentionally today, um, we want to also just have beautiful uh, images, right? So part of the beauty of our Catholic tradition is we have beautiful art. Um, so I tried to pull some of those in my uh, presentation to help us to enter into this great mystery of the beauty of our creation and the way that we've celebrated that in, uh, in art uh, throughout and even in sculpture throughout uh, our tradition. So let's dive in. Right away in uh, the first book of the Bible, the beginning, Genesis, the word of the book refers to what uh, the first words are in the beginning, right? So the very beginning of creation the very beginning of our discussion of who we are as men and women, we have to go to the beginning, right? So the famous uh, image from the Sistine Chapel of the creation of Adam. And this pivotal, pivotal verse from Genesis chapter 1, God created mankind in his image. That word mankind, or when you see man today, it's the general. Uh, so in Latin, it's homo, right? This is referring to us as human beings, as a, a, a species. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So right away from the very beginning, we have this foundational truth that we as human beings, as human persons, are created in the image of God, which is just staggering. That God creates us in his own image, that we reflect him in some way. And then right away, this is the same verse. It goes on to say, male and female, he created them. So somehow the fact that you and I are in the image of God has everything to do with the fact that we're created male and female. There are two kinds of human beings, right? That God, in creating us in his image, doesn't just make one kind of human. He makes two basic kinds, male and female. And so the fact that we are created in God's image, we have to right away hold that right beside the fact that we are created as male and female. And this is a, a kind of a foundational truth that cultures around the world have understood. So you might remember, some of you, uh, if you, if you studied some Greek philosophy, uh, there's this, there was this myth among the Greeks that we originally, it's kind of a strange myth, um, but they had some strange, uh, they were an interesting people. Um, they had this myth that we were originally spheres, that human beings originally were, were spherical. So just kind of picture that for a second, um, but that somehow because of some, uh, uh, something that went wrong very early on, that's a theme also in a lot of kind of cultures of the world, uh, seeds of the truth of what scripture teaches us and what God reveals to us, 
are there even in cultures uh, before Christianity and apart from Christianity because God desires everyone to know the truth. So there's this foundational sense that like something went wrong and we've been split. And this is kind of the idea of soulmates comes from this, that basically human beings now, we're, we're half. We're half of the sphere. And we're walking around and we're looking for our other half. There's where that expression comes from, right? That we're somehow not complete by ourselves. Okay, so there's something right and something wrong about that that we'll come to. But that's kind of there from the very beginning. So this sense that like there are two kinds of human beings, male and female, he created them. If, if, if uh, an alien came to planet Earth and was observing the human species, that alien would pretty quickly realize there are two basic kinds of them, right? And something seems to draw them to each other, right? And of course, this is something we see in the animal world as well, right? Something draws us to each other. And yet also we recognize there's uh, a lot of tension. There's a lot of friction in the relationship between men and women. And where did that come from? So, created in the image of God. We have a God. This is the uh, famous icon from Andrei Rublev of the Trinity. It's based on the, um, the story that's told in Genesis of Abraham when he receives these three uh, uh, visitors called the hospitality of Abraham. And he seats them at table. And it's this mysterious thing that you see in the scriptures. You see it even in Genesis when God says, let us create men in our own image. It's like, who's he talking to? Let us create men in our own, own image. It's already in the very beginning, long before the Trinity is revealed, there's a hint of that right away in Genesis. And here, with the hospitality of Abraham, these three guests, they speak in the singular, and yet there's three of them. Somehow, we believe, of course, as Christians, that, that God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ that our God himself, one God, exists in three persons. That our God literally in himself is relationship. And again, that's hugely important when we consider that we are made in the image of that God. God who is relationship in himself. That who God is, is a father who has an image of himself, an idea of himself, that he loves, that idea of himself, the image of himself, the word, the eternal word, he loves and pours his, his love into from all eternity. The son returns the father's love, receives and returns the father's love from all eternity. And that the love between them, we could say, is so real that it's in itself a third person. This uh, St. Augustine said, if we had to come up with a proper name for the Holy Spirit, it would be gift. That the Holy Spirit is the gift of the Father to the Son. And the Son returning the gift to the Father. We could spend all day and the rest of our lives talking about the Trinity, but those are some foundational things that God in himself is not just, we believe one God, absolutely, we're monotheistic, but God is not somehow alone, all by himself, lonely. God in himself is a relationship of love. Three persons in one God. And so you and I are created in the image of that God and we're made to live forever in unity with that God. And so one of the beautiful things about Rublev's icon is the way that it's uh, composed, there's a seat at the table. There's a seat at the table and even the gesture there to come and sit, come and receive, come and be in union with this God. God who has made us in his image and who desires us to be with him forever. So God in himself is relationship and you and I are made in the image of that God. Okay, what does that mean then for us? Found famous quote from Pope St. John Paul II. 
was pope from uh, 1979 to 2005. I think those dates are right. Um, was the pope who was formative for me growing up uh, and entering into seminary. Uh, and about half of the time that I was in seminary preparing to be a priest. Amazing, amazing pope who did so much uh, for the church in moving us to really engage uh, joyfully and confidently with the challenges of uh, the modern era. This is from his opening encyclical, Redemptor Hominis. There's that homo, that's the genitive form. The Redeemer of Man, that Christ is the Redeemer of mankind, the Redeemer of the human person. He says, man cannot live without love. He remains a being that is incomprehensible for himself. His life is senseless if love is not revealed to him. If he does not encounter love, if he does not experience it and make it his own, if he does not participate intimately in it. So, love has to be revealed to us. We don't just kind of find it on our own. Somehow it has to be revealed to us what true love is. We have to encounter it, experience it, and not just kind of have it somehow be out there, but we have to make it our own. We have to participate intimately in it. And if we don't do that, we're incomprehensible to ourselves. Our lives are senseless. Foundational about who we are, understanding who we are. We cannot live without love. Our culture knows this at some deep level, but we've, we've, we've uh, not boiled it down, reduced it to... We can't live without sex, which is, of course, totally false. I have personal witness to that, right? <laughs> uh, I'm doing just fine, right? But what's true is that we cannot live without love. But we long ago separated love and sex, didn't we? And that's part of the break that happens right in the beginning. Man cannot live without love. And so he says, this is why Christ the Redeemer and now he's quoting the Second Vatican Council, fully reveals man to himself. It was John Paul II, probably his favorite quote from Vatican II, 1962 to 65. Vatican II said that Jesus Christ fully reveals man to himself. If you want to know who you are, if you want to know the meaning of your life, if you want to know how to be happy, he says, you, the council said, you cannot discover that, we cannot know that without reference to Jesus Christ. We can't figure it out on our own. It's only in him that we know who we are. You know, we know what our life is meant to be about, and we know how we're supposed to live, and we know the way to true happiness. It's only in him, only in Jesus Christ. And so, St. John Paul II, uh, one, one of the things that's foundational for his teaching is what he calls the law of the gift. And here's the quote, uh, a related quote from Vatican II, that document, Gaudium et Spes, Joy and Hope. It was the church's document on uh, uh, engaging with the modern world. Man who is the only creature on earth which God willed for himself. That's really important. God created us not because he had to, not because he was lonely, not because he had a, a crisis of ego and needed little minions to serve him or worship him because he desired to share his love. He's perfectly happy in himself, could have chosen never to create the world. And it wouldn't have detracted one ounce from his glory and his beauty and his happiness, his joy, through all eternity. But the catechism right at the beginning says, in a plan of sheer goodness, it's just because he's so good, sheer goodness God decides to create the world, and he creates human beings as the pinnacle of his creation, even more so than the angels who are higher than us in the order of creation, but are ordered to the service of God and service of us. But we are created simply out of goodness. The only creature on earth that, which God willed for himself. Everything else is meant to serve us. You and I are ordered to be with God forever. So what does that mean? We can't fully find himself. We can't fully find ourselves, excuse me, except through a sincere gift of ourselves. The only way, and St. John Paul II this is, says this is the great paradox that's at the heart of human existence. 
that if we want to find ourselves, we have to give ourselves away in love. And that's really foundational. The letter to the Philippians, St. Paul says that Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, he's quoting probably a much earlier Christian hymn, probably one of the earliest uh, texts that we have in the whole New Testament. St. Paul says there's this hymn in the early church, Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. But rather he emptied himself and took the form of a slave. And he came in human form and was found human in appearance. And he emptied himself and was obedient even to death and to death on a cross. And because of this, God exalts him and gives him the name above, other, above every other name, the name of the Lord. But that really important, that idea of not grasping. Jesus, who is God, empties himself and comes as a human being. This is why he fully reveals us to ourselves. Because Jesus is in himself God and man together, divinity and humanity married in one person of the word incarnate. And so Jesus doesn't grasp at, he is God, but he, he empties himself and he comes and he's a baby who lies in a manger. And he has this human nature that can suffer and can die. And he reveals to us in that and who can feel loneliness. In the garden, he's lonely because his friends aren't there for him in his hour of greatest need. He redeems that experience of being lonely. God knows what it is to feel lonely and God even knows what it is to feel abandoned by God. That's a staggering thought. He comes to reveal us to ourselves because we don't know who we are. That's what happened in the garden and we can get to that. But that's a foundational thing that he doesn't grasp at divinity, but he empties himself. So this idea of not grasping, but rather receiving as a gift, foundational for happiness. What happens because of the fall is that you and I don't trust and we're afraid, and so we want to grasp at happiness. And we want to grasp at other people. And what Jesus reveals to us is, no, if you want to be happy, you have to give yourself away. You have to love rather than seeking to be loved. There's the prayer of St. Francis. You have to seek to understand rather than worrying about being understood. You have to console other people rather than trying to be consoled. Forgetting myself, that's actually the way to happiness. Self-forgetfulness, self-gift, the law of the gift. Okay, let's look at the garden. So from Genesis chapter 2, we're now in the second. If you've read the beginning chapters of Genesis, you notice there's two different stories of creation. The second, first one kind of focuses on uh, where we are in uh, creation. Second story also touches on that, but then talks about the relationship between men and woman, man and woman. So the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. It's the first time in the Bible God says something is not good. In the first creation story, he said, it's good, it's good, it's good, and it's very good. Every day of creation, and then when he creates man, it's very good. Now God says it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suited to him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature was then its name. Man gave names to all the tame animals, all the birds of the air, all the wild animals, but none proved to be a helper suited to the man. So, what's the scripture revealing to us? Why in all of the wonderful creatures that are uh, in creation, Adam's having a nice little time there feeding that lovely little deer, but his heart is still lonely. Why is he lonely? Because none of these animals is like him. He recognizes, I'm different. I'm not just an animal. Not only do I look different than them, but none of them is thinking about, well, why am I here? What is the meaning of my life? Like, elephants don't have those thoughts, right? We can talk about animals having emotions. That's okay. But, like, there, are, there, are, there is a whole other level of self-knowledge, of self-awareness, and the capacity to love, to sacrifice. So much that is proper to us as human beings that we don't find in the animal world. We're not simply animals. 
We're a body and soul composite. This is foundational. What is a human person? A human person is body and soul. Foundational. So I don't just have a body, I am a body. We don't just have bodies. It's not like the real me is inside and I'm just kind of like animating this, this bag of flesh, right? Now we do have a soul that endures after we die, but what do we believe as Christians? We believe that that separation of body and soul is unnatural. That at the end of time, our body and soul are gonna be reunited. We'll be whole again, because that's how we're made. We're a composite, a union of body and soul. And so who I am is my body. Here's a little uh, example. If I say, look at me, where are you looking? Not over there. Not over there. If I say now, look at my body, they're like, oh, Father, you're a priest. I don't know. <laughs> right? I'm wearing a sweater, right? But why is that different? We immediately, that's sexual, isn't it? Look at my body, look at her body, look at his body. So immediately we've reduced the person, right? But where else are you gonna look, right? Because the body is who I am. But the reason that that's uncomfortable, that's the whole thing, that's what's happened to us. That's what we're gonna talk about. Okay, so we'll come back to that. We are a union, a composite of body and soul. All right. This is what St. John Paul II says. The TOB is Theology of the Body, the series of talks that he gave, unpacking uh, several different scriptures, starting with uh, the text of Genesis. So he says, when God, Yahweh, said, it is not good that man should be alone, he affirmed that alone, man does not completely realize this essence, the essence of being human. He realizes it only by existing with someone and even more deeply and completely by existing for someone. We don't really fully realize who we are unless we exist with and for someone else. It's not good for the human being to be alone. We're made for, we're made for communion and we're made for a gift of ourselves. Okay, St. John Paul II calls that original solitude, that Adam is by himself and realizes it's not good. So then what does God do to teach him? The Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the Lord God then built the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman. It's really important. Why is it a rib? He doesn't choose a toe, right? That he would somehow be over her. He doesn't take a, a hair from his head so that she would somehow be over him. But it's a rib, it's from the side. And the rib is part of what protects the heart, right? And so already in, in just that little detail, this is a mythic language, right? Language of, of, of poetry that's been passed down for, for millennia that gets at deep truths about who we are. The rib, it's part of what protects the heart. That they're made somehow to be a gift to each other. And he brings her to the man, and the man says, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one has been taken. And then the sacred author says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. And the two of them become one body. There's a great mystery. How two become one. And how do two become one? The man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. He's talking about marriage, where two become one body. Two bodies become one, but that's a sign in God's plan of something far, far deeper. When two bodies become one, if we are a union of body and soul, what happens when two bodies come together in sexual union? 
Well, two persons are becoming one. There's a gift, there's an interpersonal gift. The two persons are becoming one, right? Okay. St. John Paul calls this original unity, the two becoming one. And he says, our bodies have the capacity of expressing love. That love in which the person becomes a gift. And by means of this gift, fulfills the meaning of his being and existence. So what are we saying? Man and woman, we are different. Both created in the image of God. And different, different bodies, which means different souls. If we're a composite of body and soul, which means it's impossible then, right, for to have a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa, because we're a union, body and soul. This is who I am. This is how I've been created by God as a gift, to be a gift. Man and woman, different. Bodies are different. But the bodies, just by basic biology, and the Martian would notice this, they go together, even just on a physical level. They're made for this union where two can become one. And it's the place where new life comes from. There's a hint there of the Trinity, the image that we're created in. Right? And so the fact that we are made to make a gift of ourselves, capable of two becoming one, the body has this capacity of expressing love, the way that we can become a gift. St. John Paul calls that the nuptial meaning of the body. The nuptial meaning of the body, that our bodies are ordered towards marriage, towards nuptials. Our bodies are ordered towards marriage. And you're going, but Father, you're not married. How are you fulfilled as a human being? Hold on to that thought, right? Because what's marriage pointing to is another question. All right. Really importantly, St. John Paul goes on and he says the man, Genesis, in telling us about these uh, first man and first woman, it says they were both naked, yet they felt no shame. Really important. How we were brought into being. We were naked, but we felt no shame. Why? Because the man looked at the woman and didn't just see a body in the sense that we recoil from. We're like, oh, that's sexual. Somehow that's like already lustful. No, he saw her body. And he also saw, because he saw her body, her body revealed who she is as a person. And in seeing her as a person, his heart was drawn to her and he said, this is someone whom I can love and make a gift of myself to. This is one who I can become one with. And I desire to make a gift of myself to her. And I want to receive her as a gift. And Eve looked at Adam and saw, this is a man who loves me and who I love and who I desire to give myself to and to receive into myself and a desire to become one. She looked at him and she saw the beauty of him as a person. They feel no shame. There's no fear of being used or misunderstood or treated as an object. No shame. But then we know what happens. So St. Paul calls that original nakedness. And then we have original shame. After the eating of the fruit, you know, it's interesting, just as a sidebar, um, it's very hard to do a Google search for Adam and Eve. It's very hard to find an image of them without the apple in the picture. That's all, it's just like, we're fixed on that, the fall. She's always handing it to him, or the serpent is one word, like the serpent was like coiled around his leg, right? Because this is, we know what happened, right? They grasp at being like God, but without God, and what happens is brokenness, isolation enters into the world. What the scripture describes it as, the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. Well, they were naked before. <laughs> what happened? Something changed. And immediately, their nakedness is not okay. They make fig leaves and they sew fig leaves together and make loincloths for themselves. They hide from each other. 
And what do they hide? They don't put their hands behind their back. They hide their sexual organs. They make loincloths. Both of them do. And then they hide from God. They hear the God walking about in the garden. It's the time when they were going to walk together. So beautiful. And they hide themselves from God among the trees. And then when God says, where are you? Adam answers for both of them. I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Original shame. Let's talk for a second about shame. This is Rodin's sculpture, The Shame of Eve. So expressive. What happens in shame? Why do they both make loincloths? It's really interesting, I think. I think we can, in some level, easily understand why she, make, why she covers herself. She's afraid of being used. He looks at her now, and there's a different look in his eye. Now he sees her as a body, in like that sexual sense that we hear it, as one who can be used by him, one that he can use, one that can bring him pleasure. Then divorced from her goodness as a person, and his heart suddenly is, is, is overwhelmed by these urges that have been there before, but before were under the control of his reason. Now they're like boiling out of control. And there's a part of him that just wants to be like an animal and take her for himself. And even in the way that he looks at her, she, she recoils. She doesn't want to be used. She knows that she's not made for that. Ladies, sadly, with great reverence, you know what this is, look is like. It's not what we're made for. But we know this is part of our fallenness. This is part of why we wear clothing. But gentlemen, why does he cover himself? It's a really interesting question. What's he ashamed of? Part of the whole narrative is he's supposed to protect her. He was put there to protect her. Protect the garden. The serpent is not like a little garden snake. The Hebrew is more like a, 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 a sea monster or something. And it's threatening her. There's a veiled threat in the way that the serpent speaks to Eve. She looks at him and says, where were you when I needed you? Some man you are. He feels deeply inadequate. Deeply inadequate. And so he's ashamed. He covers himself as well. Also, in her, in her glance, there's a desire just to use him, to manipulate him to get what she needs. They desire to use each other. And this is the legacy of sin, how our sexuality has been broken. It's not what God desires for us. And so what happens? He sends us his son. He sends us Jesus, who fully reveals to us what it is to be human. And Jesus... His first miracle is where? At a wedding. Not a coincidence. That's Christ there on the left in the blue and red. And who's to his right, our left? Who is it? Who is it, Alejandro? It's his mom. Exactly. It's Mary. And look how she's gesturing. They have no wine. It's Mary. Very good. Right? She's there. He's the new Adam. She's the new Eve. Beginning a new race new way of being human. God is restoring to us what was lost. She's conceived without sin. He is God himself, incapable of sinning. So look at what happens in Ephesians 5. This is that famous passage about being submissive. What does St. Paul say? He says, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one hates his own flesh. Well, the two have become one flesh. So he can't hate her. She's his flesh. No one hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church because we're members of his body. And then St. Paul quotes right back to the beginning, if Genesis chapter 2. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. And St. Paul says this is a great mystery, how two can become one, but it's about something even greater. And the even greater is Christ and the church. It's God and us, God and humanity. That you and I are made to be married to God. That's the great mystery. You and I are made to be united with God for all eternity in heaven. And Jesus in himself, the marriage of divinity and humanity, is the witness to that. 
That's what God desires for us. And what happens through the sacraments, guys, what happens through all the sacramental life of the church, and especially through the Eucharist, where what happens, we take his body into ourselves. That's nuptial. The church talks about the altar. This is like a wedding bed. This is where Christ, as the bridegroom, makes love to his bride. And if that makes you uncomfortable, deal with it. Because I didn't come up with the whole thing, right? <laughs> Jesus did. It's where he makes love to his bride. And what happens on a, on a wedding night when the bride and groom become one flesh? What does he say to her? He says, this is my body and it's for you. And she takes him into herself, his body. A new life comes from that. Same thing that happens on a sacramental level, on a deeper level, the greater mystery is Christ and the church. That God desires to come into us and to bring new life, to make us new. And so there's a lot more in the theology of the body, a whole lot more. But one of the things John Paul points to is he points to Jesus' words in the gospel that it's not just what Moses told you about uh, if a man divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery. He says, no, even if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And so he's pointing to the heart because that's what Jesus comes to redeem. And then John Paul takes the, uh, another cue from the point in the gospel where they ask Jesus about divorce. Well, Moses allowed us to divorce. And he says, yes, in the beginning, it wasn't like that. In the beginning, it was not so. And they ask him this thing about uh, uh, the woman that had seven husbands and, you know, and who she can be married to in the resurrection. And he says, you greatly misunderstand. In heaven, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Jesus is clear that in heaven, there is no marriage. Because marriage is an earthly sign that points to the greater mystery. Heaven is the greater mystery. And so John Paul will unpack all of those. But I want to just end with two things that John Paul II gives us. One of them is what he calls the personalist principle. His whole philosophy is personalism. But he says in Love and Responsibility that he wrote before he was uh, Pope, a person must not be merely the means to an end for another person. We can't be merely the means to an end. And so to love another person as an end in themselves and never to use them. One of the insights from John Paul II is that the real opposite of love is use. The opposite of love is use. And so look at what he says. The sexual urge in a human being is always in the natural course of things directed towards another human being. It's the normal form that it takes. If it's directed towards the sexual attributes as such, then we have to recognize that that's an impoverishment or even a perversion of the urge. That sexual urge that we feel, it's not just about, wow, look at her body. It's meant to be in God's design. Look at how beautiful she is as a person. And I want to be one with her. I want to some, in some way give myself to her and for her. And it doesn't have to be sexually because in heaven there is no marriage. John Paul will do a whole thing on celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. That's another day, right? But our sexuality, he says, ultimately is about making myself a gift for another person. Let me end with this. Love, he says, consists of a commitment which limits one's freedom. We don't, that's, that's challenging for us as modernists, isn't it? Love consists of a commitment which limits one's freedom. It's a giving of the self, and to give oneself means just that, to limit one's freedom on behalf of another. Limitation on one's freedom might seem to be something negative and unpleasant, but love makes it a positive, joyful, and creative thing. Freedom exists for the sake of love. Freedom exists for the sake of love. It's not about doing what I want. It's that the full dignity of my humanity is to say, I'm going to make a gift of myself to another. I'm going to actually limit my freedom. I'm going to use my freedom to limit myself because I want to be a gift to you. And in that, there's the whole paradox, in that we come fully alive. Whereas if I use my freedom to say, I can do whatever I want, it makes us small and ultimately less than human. So guys, there's a lot there. We're going to unpack it over the course of the day. That's the great mystery that God has revealed to us and he's revealed, to it, revealed it to us in Jesus Christ.
pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father, for that really beautiful talk. Um, and just a little note, if there's anything in these talks that make you uncomfortable or it's just unsettling, like I ask that you just reverently honor that um, and notice it. And it's not to be pushed away. It's meant to just be held and honor it and bring it to the Lord. Um, we're going to take about a, now about 10 minute break um, between now and Dr. Regnerus's talk. Um, so yeah, um, so Dr. Regnerus, whenever you are, um, we're going to start around 12. So. Feel free to take a break. Um, to